Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashish Raste. Uh, I work at uh, Acoustic Research Lab in US. And first of all, uh, I'm thankful to Chinmay and the Hackerspace guys for organizing this wonderful event. I mean, I think this is close to an, a year, right? I mean, no. Yes, yeah, the 12th meter, yeah, so I think 10th. once in a month. Yeah. So uh, for a year, I mean, it's pretty awesome. I've been here a couple of times only. But so I just wanted to share uh, and simultaneously work on something so that I could share with other guys uh, on what I am interested in. Um, so today's paper is a uh, little bit, that's it, I guess the intro is enough. <laughs> uh, robust range only beacon localization. Uh, this paper was written by the guys at uh, CCL at MIT. Uh, and one of them, uh, I mean, uh, most of them are kind of pioneers in marine robotics uh, field. And this, I would uh, get started with what they have done in this paper. So this, uh, the research work done in this paper is more kind of applied robotics, that is field robotics. And so that you apply the uh, concepts of science, maths uh, into the robotics arena so that to improve uh, how robots behave in an underwater scenario. So first, simply to put, uh, I would like to ask, uh, if, if you are given a skateboard, then how would you navigate in your office space uh, blindfolded? I mean, when you don't see anything and you are on top of a skateboard and you want to go from point A to point B, then how would you probably navigate? Sonar. Uh, you don't have any sonar vision. You are just a human. I mean, at the max, you <laughs> can very slow you vision. can shout, and uh, <laughs> if there are some echo walls <laughs> that can give you the feedback, then you can localize yourself where you are. How you ask my colleagues? <laughs> yeah. So the the concept here is that you have walls around in your office space, right? I mean, if you know them well, that by touching them and sensing them. Oh, okay. So this wall is kind of bulged out. Oh, so I'm based on your past memory. You you could localize yourself where you are, and so that you slowly move uh, to point A to point B. So a similar concept is uh, applied to the robots in underwater environment, where robots don't know where uh, their position is because you don't get the GPS signals uh, underwater. So th this task is uh, kind of an analogy for the underwater environment, the skateboard task. <laughs> So basically, an underwater vehicle has a couple or more of sensors. Uh, the primary ones are the Doppler velocity log. Uh, I will just go through each of their, I mean, what uh, those sensors give you the feedback of. Uh, Doppler velocity log is used for, primarily is for bottom tracking, where you get to know uh, what speed over the ground, I mean, the bottom surface of the water that your vehicle is moving in. And initial measurement uh, unit has a set of, uh, I mean, it might have one or more of gyroscopes, magnetometers, so that you get to know the roll pitch yaw, similar to an aeroplane's sensors. So it, it tells you the orientation of what your vehicle is. And a compass is, of course, gives you the true north uh, heading. Um, so based on these sensors, uh, the robot has to localize where it is in a given environment, and it has to navigate around in a region. So this is the task that has been discussed in this paper. Uh, you can just uh, interrupt me if, if you have any doubts anywhere in along the slides. I would be glad to get interrupted and will try my best to resume from there. So uh, I think this slide could be explained better by drawing something. And I'll just get started. Before that, I would like to tell what, uh, I think I didn't tell that, what beacons are. Uh, so here we are talking about long baseline uh, transponders, I mean, which are kind of uh, acoustic modems kind of thing. So where you have a transponder and you have, uh, you have a transducer and you have a transponder. So that transducer sends acoustic uh, pulses and in for the feedback you get the uh, information of where that particular uh, transponder is. So 
here we are talking about LBL beacons. So each of the beacon have their own IDs. So you can uh, differentiate one beacon from the another and they give you the range information. Range is nothing but uh, in a terrestrial space, it's similar to the laser range finder. So that uh, if you have, you might have heard about uh, the drones using laser range finders or camera tracking systems so that they get to know how far they are from each of the sensors. So these are their underwater uh, analogy, I mean for the underwater environment. So here the beacon gives you a unique ID for a reply as well as the range, how far your vehicle is from those set of beacons. And, and those beacons are static? They are, they should be static. Okay. Okay. So, so, so then based on the ID you can know which beacon exactly you are. Exactly the beacon, well, yeah. well, if you know the beacon's exact position yeah. and <coughs> how far you are, then you can localize yourself slightly, I guess. Right. So you can triangulate, right? Yeah. 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 If Triangulation you have is beacons. the primary task, but here uh, there is one more uh, kind of, they have com uh, complicated the problem such that you don't know the beacon's position and okay. they might be deployed whenever you want, I mean, using drones or something. Uh, so it it's kind of uh, immediate deploy and take action environment. So this kind of task might be useful for search and rescue operations, where underwater vehicles go and uh, localize. Even for aircraft rescue, you have a transponder there also. It it, it emits pulses at about uh, 30 kilohertz, I guess, for about one month. Uh, I guess they have improved. Uh, they have increased that time to two months or so. So within that period, you have to. Uh, see and hear acoustically where that transponder which you are talking with is. So these beacons are uh, used primarily for that. Uh, mainly these are also used by uh, oil and gas and other subsea based companies for giving their vehicles and remotely operated vehicles an accurate uh, position to for, so that the vehicles could know where, uh, where it is and it could uh, I mean it could satisfy its task. So I'm just drawing the beacons in uh, shapes of cylinders. The more the number of beacons, the better uh, your vehicle's navigation would be. Uh, and this, each of these beacons would form a kind of a uh, region. I mean, wherever you want to deploy them and your vehicle would be somewhere here. So, so this is the underwater vehicle AV, and uh, it will send a ping, like a query ping, asking each of those beacons where it is. And in response, as I said, it will get an ID as well as a range, like some distance. Let's say that R. And it keeps doing this for uh, continuously un un uh, until it localizes where it is within that region. And later it localizes the beacons where they are. Uh, these are just the relative coordinates so that if it is at some coordinate, uh, let's say 0, 0 for convenience, then you can just uh, plot the XY map. So uh, for the 2D region, the AV localizes first itself and then it localizes the beacons. And then that I that is useful for the AV to understand in which, uh, I mean, it, it will know its region and boundary. So it will just navigate and do its task within that region. So, so beacons, beacons don't talk to each other. Right? No, beacons don't talk to each other. Why can't beacons talk to each other? Because they are just used for uh, responding yes. purposes. They don't, they don't act as kind of, uh, they, they are the kind of transceivers. Right. I mean, because you have to receive uh, acoustic signal and then respond with some response. But Why uh, can't they talk to each other? Then? You you could uh, make the beacons talk to each other. In that case, they will be acting like uh, kind of modems, underwater acoustic modems. Okay. So you have both modulation and demodulation taking place. In that case, they could localize like that network could localize. Yes, itself. yes, they are in fact. Uh, they will, I mean, some of them uh, that kind of technology is being in fact developed by our lab also, okay. uh, acoustic research lab. Uh, where we, uh, you might have heard about Subner also. Uh, it's a startup company uh, where Sean is working, <laughs> Shanmugam. 
so they they have the underwater modems where uh, these modems could be deployed over a la large range of area such that uh, they will be able to localize themselves among talking to each other and even to transmit uh, packets from one point to the other point so it's kind of a uh, network wifi network underwater so, so it's kind of cool wouldn't that be an issue with power usage because now you're doing a lot more than just responding to things definitely yeah the power the task will be there. so that's why they are limited to only until certain uh, yeah because of the, or imagine something like this is simple because the the beacons could just go to sleep yeah. and not whenever they are not they get pinged and then they will okay yeah, i'm going to respond usually they do that i mean they so are that's underlying why, electronics that's why they can last what you last for what like two, two months or whatever you say uh, that that is for the transponders okay uh, but even then like but they yeah, what they emit every minute or optimized something. way would be that i guess yeah, yeah. So I haven't studied about that so, in detail. So the interesting thing in in uh, the driverless trains here, they have uh -huh. they use beacons as well. Driverless have, what? The trains. Trains. Okay. They use beacons on the yeah, track as well yeah. to localize the trains. And, and only they when they are passive beacons, like what you say, they are not. Uh, and when the trains oh, they are not go active, on top right. of that, they are energized and then. That's right. When right. 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 Understand. Yeah, so the word is there, I guess, passive weekends. So yes. only when they are yes. queried, they will respond. Yeah, then they will yeah. energize. Yeah. And these are battery powered. Yeah. I guess the, the but this is not the possible are, because they're on the track, right? So the train has one? to go above it. But I guess for this case, yeah. it's not possible. Like yeah. 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 Too far, that, that, yeah. That's the dif difference. This is 2D, whereas the train is 1D. Yeah. 1D, right. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, is this 2D or is this 3D? I mean, the it's 2D. It's in fact uh, 2D, oh, the, re underwater. the whole yeah, whole region, underwater, but yeah. the AV has to localize itself uh, in 3D dimensions. Right, right. Yeah, so that's why you have so those the sensors. The beacons are like floating the or are they on the floor? No, they will be on the floor of okay. uh, the sea. Yeah. So it's 3D. And they should be static. Sometimes it happens that they tend, they might move as well if strong currents or mm. such things are there. That's why you need to have some robust localization mm. techniques that this paper talks about. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So you cannot assume that the beacon is always active. always static, yeah. Ah, so cool. you have to keep uh, yeah, localizing them as well. Altitude as well, right? Because of the sea bank. Yeah, altitude uh, definitely changes a lot. Yeah. So it may not be able to send a direct signal. Yeah. In many cases. Right? It's it the signal. It's kind of uh, 3D, I would say. It it transmits a spherical spherical kind of signal, so that it's not uh, limited to two dimensional circle. But here we explain the concepts in terms of two dimensions. Yeah. But in that case, the signal can reflect at other surfaces and reach other beacons, and which will create more right. confusion. Right. Right. So that that is the upcoming slides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was the basics on uh, the sensor range measurements. I mean, here the sensors are nothing but the beacons, and uh, you can see at uh, time. The three different times are given here, T1, T2, and T3. And at each of the time, uh, it, it gets a range measurement from those beacons. And the circles are nothing but having a radii of uh, how much uh, the range that it is getting. Like say the first larger one might, let's say five meters, the next three and next four. And so, is that, so it, it knows that the beacons, okay, uh, the beacons are on the circumference of the circle and it is far from so and so meters or kilometers for that purpose. So yeah, the main problem here is uh, whenever uh, acoustic related uh, concepts, I mean they are applied underwater, you have uh, many kind, two kinds of noise primarily, one is additive noise and one is multiplicative noise. Uh, Multiplicative noise is nothing but uh, based on the sound's travel time, uh, it might get diffracted or uh, interrupted by many other uh, in between particles or whatever uh, there underwater, and it kind of directly multiplies to the noise that I mean the range that you get. And additive is like uh, you, you get multiple reflections, like say from the surface water or from uh, different organisms, let's say. Even uh, I think snapping shrimps and those kinds of uh, animals underwater, they have their own acoustic pulses that, that you might get and sometimes it happens that their frequency are much closer to the beacon's frequency. So you might get confused uh, with those noises as well. On top of this, uh, the vehicles that we are uh, talking about here, they might have some sonars, like uh, the person said earlier, 
so these sonars have operate uh, they, they they sometimes operate uh, around the frequencies of these beacon communications and usually the frequencies that we are talking about here is about in the range of 20 kilohertz to 130 kilohertz yeah some sonars operate in this range also as well <coughs> Yes. So here, in the third uh, instance of time, uh, we we might not be sure whether it's an actual beacon or not because of the noise that we discussed just now. So to identify which, uh, which set of, I mean, what what are the sets of beacons that are true and they are not noise, we have to do some kind of uh, kind of outlier rejection technique. So it's very plainly simple that we apply usually for image processing, signal processing. Whenever you have a set of data, even for uh, database mining and stuff, you have, you have definitely some noise and you have to kind of remove all this noise to get a good set of data uh, after which you can process upon on that. So the outlier rejection technique is the, I would say, the main component of this paper uh, and the next component that, that is to navigate around the space, it's kind of well uh, researched upon. So this technique is, uh, it, it, it was, I mean I was impressed by this technique and because it, it used a uh, graph cut algorithm, uh, here I will just quickly go through that. So here let's assume you have a beacon and at time t1 you get a measurement of uh, how far you are from that beacon. So you your vehicle imaginarily draws a circle kind of thing with that uh, range that the beacon gives you. So and at the center of the circle is nothing but the position of your vehicle. And so at time t2 you move to another point uh, and you again query and you get back some range. And at the at the intersection of these circles should uh, should be the point where your beacon must lie. So here uh, we have two intersection points. So both are good possibilities for, for your beacon to be uh, present there at those points. But since we have uh, noise, we might, we will surely have noisy data. So we have to kind of uh, uh, neglect or remove the noise from the actual beacons. For that, uh, we form a graph. Uh, in this graph, is nothing but the set of measurements that you consecutively take. I mean, this paper recommends um, they, for their work, they took about uh, 10 minutes of continuous uh, measurements with the uh, five second gap, I guess, the query period. In intervals of five seconds, they, the vehicle queries and then sees what uh, the beacons that have responded and then uh, they take those measurements and form this graph. So this graph is, uh, the nodes are nothing but the measurements and you connect two measurements, uh, the node, you connect two nodes if you see them to be consistent. Here the, con the meaning of con consistent that the authors apply is for the measurements which are kind of uh, valid, I mean like, like the one shown here, M1 and M2 sit sitting on top of each other so you have two intersection mm -hmm. points. So this, this is for one beacon. So they take this set of measurements as consistent. So they do this for a few minutes and then they form this graph. So when you say measurements, they are actual uh, distance measurements or? or, yeah, this, or these, are all, okay. these are all uh, found from the range, okay. ranges. So here let's say you have only one beacon that you want to right. localize and you want to make sure that that beacon is not a noise. Okay. It's an actual beacon. Right. So you take measurement one at time t1 and you have that range. Based on that, again you go to some other point and then you take. Uh, and usually for the triangulation that uh, our friend just uh, noted about, uh, for that you, you should not travel in a collinear uh, line, I mean in a straight line. Right. You should make sure that uh, you should travel in the random or, yeah. but make sure that it's, it's not a collinear because yeah. it won't make sense uh, to then later localize where the beacons are. Yeah. So, so can I just say yeah, when sure. you were saying that uh, if you are if you're connecting two <coughs> measurements and you're saying that means they make sense. So, for example, in hmm. this scenario, M1 and M2 uh, make sense because they intersect. 
Right. But if M1 and M2 were such that they would they were not intersecting, then they would mean that they are not correlated. Probably one of them or both yeah. of them are. So then kind you of won't join them in the graph. Yeah, is that, is I that won't join them. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fairness. So the ones that are intersecting for a beacon. I mean, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, here you can have multiple, but we are only talking about Let's one beacon. Yeah, it's easier to talk yeah. with just one beacon. Right? Starting from one beacon and then la later you can localize other beacons as well. So you, you connect the measurements only when they are, I mean, you, you call them as consistent only when they are interested. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this, the beacon setback is ID. So yeah. the noise impact would have like an ID you could decode from the response. No, before uh, filtering out the packet, I think this is a good question. I didn't think about it before. Uh, before uh, getting the packet, uh, your vehicle should make sure it, it just at the lower level, it senses that some packet has received, has been received or some signal has been received. So you can eliminate uh, then and there itself at the DSP level or before uh, decoding what information is there inside that packet. I think th that is the thing. That Thank you. Like does not know the IDs, right? So it can't validate ID. It, if it gets a wrong ID, it just assumes that it's another beacon, or does it know all the beacon IDs that exist? It, it should primarily know the beacon IDs. Uh, but if you like, if you drop new beacons, mm -hmm. then you there's no way to tell the way. There is no way to know whether so ID. Well, but I it's like whole it stack, right? You can have some kind of error detecting coding of the IDs and then yeah. about like on the lowest level you, can, you have some physical layer, you have some some coding solution to this and then you can still get again you have the data and then you decode measurements it. But, 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 at, but at the same time one of the other noise uh, sources could be reflection so it could be a valid beacon ID it's but just the, distance is wrong. It's, uh, the distance is wrong because actually yeah, right. reflection is not a direct so the reflections are the primary problem here but as you said uh, I believe we can also have a vehicle move in such that it doesn't need to know uh, the IDs beforehand right. because in, in the environments that these things operate, I think that wouldn't make sense. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. And also, so it's beacons. not like the beacons know the distance, right? It's, you, you try yeah. to figure yeah. out the yeah. distance from it's just the a time of arrival. I mean, of the signal yeah. you get back. So exactly. that yeah. I agree, like the ID could also be a certain pattern. You know, if the pattern is wrong, then yeah, it's not a valid idea. Right. No, no, but I mean, even if the, the, the whole packet, you, you get it correctly, it decodes correctly, but it's not like you know, it's two fields, one with an ID and one with the distance. The yeah. distance yeah. is figured out from the yeah. physical... Right. And the interesting thing is because of the way this works, you get the distance <laughs> measurement very quickly because it's like just the time of the arrival, the difference in like when, when you send and when you get back, mm -hmm. whereas from that step to actually decode is a lot more computation. Especially for embedded systems like these, right? These are like tiny little robots that are running around. So it's a lot more computation to do that. Uh, but I, I here, uh, I think I should note that the beacons themselves don't explicitly tell uh, what is what the range is. Right. Based on the time of flight, the vehicle calculates. Yeah. Time. yeah. So here, there is a maximum uh, probability that uh, because of the reflections, uh, the noise will come out. I mean, yeah. they can come two or three or more than that number of times later in time. So the vehicle might wrongly assume the range to be something else. Yeah. So looking at this vehicle is are these submarines or what? These are underwater autonomous vehicles. Yeah, autonomous robotic even used for submarines. Right. Sometimes even the ships, uh, large container ships and other uh, things use this. I mean, for them. Uh, there are kind of three classes of uh, baseline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, small baseline arrays, uh, uh, medium, I guess, and uh, long baseline arrays. The long baseline arrays are more uh, used for accurate positioning of the beacons as well as where you have a task, let's say, uh, digging some nodules underwater. Even you get <coughs> magnesium nodules uh, in deep depths. So. If, if this underwater kind of vehicle uh, navigates in that area, then it needs to know accurately where it is. So for this kind of uh, purposes, LBLs are used. Even uh, uh, ships use kind of other baseline arrays uh, called as small baseline arrays, where the transponder, I mean, it is attached to the ship's uh, hull at the bottom, and you, you might have two or more hulls, and the vehicle will be roaming 
and it doesn't need to know ex- uh, the accurate location i mean it it doesn't need to have an accurate localization uh, of itself but uh, uh, just a little bit of approximate localization is good enough for that then in that kind of scenarios you attach to the ship's hull at the bottom and then uh, with whatever you can also inverse that reverse that process so that whoever replies might be at the ship's hull or your you can put it as a way that your av replies to the ship yeah based on the task that you are uh, <coughs> thinking of so looking at the graph uh, here we let's say we have eight measurements of a single beacon and as you can see the well connected nodes are 1 to 5 and later in time the other nodes are not connected that that much so this problem uh, they have taken it as a graph cut problem where if you have a minimal cut then that means you have a maximum information uh, it it this theory i think is also applied in network flows where uh, you have a set of nodes even in social networks and any kind of networks i think uh, this theory is applied uh, you, if you can get a minimal uh, cut uh, then it, it that means that you have a maximum gain of information what is the minimal cut how do you define a minimal cut minimal cut means uh, so you have partition you just partition the graphs into two sets let's say and you make a cut among the nodes such that uh, you just segregate the two sets two sets of nodes completely completely with um, minimal i think it's with the minimal number of uh, edge okay crossings yeah okay so continuing that so any graph could be formed as an adjacency matrix here our matrix is a uh, the diagonals where the elements are like say having the same indices are initialized with zero and the ones are the indices where you have consistent measurements let's say in in the previous graph we have 1 2 connected 1 uh, 3 connected then you can see at the 1 uh, 2 and i think 1 3 I think I have written the matrix wrong. <laughs> one, 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 two, one, three, right? Uh, this should be one. Yeah. So yeah, uh, you initialize. I will just correct it later when I submit the slides. <laughs> uh, th- this is initialized as the. and in this ij will take one if a measurement i and measurement j are consistent uh, any doubt in that i'll just uh, explain how it forms i'll just take four nodes here 1 uh, 2 and 4 are connected and 3 is kind of an outlier among this set of nodes then you can just form a 4 by 4 matrix where the diagonals because you don't consider a node to be consistent with itself so in the matrix in that diagonal elements you have zeros and if 1 and 2 they are consistent so you have 1 and 1 here and it's kind of the transpose of the matrix is the same uh, and it's also a hermitian matrix uh, the, those terms are what i recently learned of uh, going through the linear algebra concepts uh, after reading this paper in fact uh, while going through this paper and 
So if you we can just check you cannot check. So here uh, since one, two, four are well connected, you have the ones in the respective indices and the others are zero. Only three is connected to four. So in the third row, fourth column, they have one. And yeah, fourth row, third column also. So this is the adjacency matrix for that set of nodes. So a good cut of this graph will uh, give you the inlayer measurements. So let's say for that example uh, of four nodes, uh, you can assume with some <coughs> statistic that uh, the third node is kind of an outlier or a noisy measurement so that you could only concentrate on the first one, two, and fourth measurement, first, second, and fourth measurement, so that whatever uh, range that they have given to your vehicle, I mean, the range calculated from them could be taken as a uh, valid range. And one more thing I think I missed, an indicator vector, right. So here we take uh, one more indicator vector. This vector is nothing but a uh, kind of binary vector 1 or 0 where uh, it will have its elements as 1 if that particular measurement is taken to be a consistent measurement. I mean after uh, after the after cutting the graph. So here for that example we have uh, indicator vector is a column vector. So you, let's say we are assuming 1, 2, and 4 to be consistent. So you have 1, 1, and you are assuming 3 to be an inlayer. So you have 1, 1, 0, 1. And th this vector will also play uh, kind of, it plays an important role to validate that you have uh, removed your outliers. You you have a statistic, I mean, they they provide a statistic uh, calling it as uh, quality of a cut uh, from calculated from RU. Here uh, RU, I mean it's, it's at the formula um, at the bottom, but the thing to be noted here is that uh, whenever, let's say you have taken only four measurements there, but uh, or eight measurements in the slides, but as, as and when you keep on traveling and keep on hearing uh, the ranges, uh, you might not be sure whether to update the matrix and because it takes a whole uh, how to put uh, it takes I mean your efficiency slows down your vehicle uh, won't be able to keep on updating the ranges and to see which are the consistent ones and forming the matrices again and again so here they just take a statistic and calculate the derivative of it so that you get to know uh, among those measurements where the maximum change is happening so that uh, it's kind of boils down to a eigenvector problem where in a matrix uh, let's say for an example if in a picture I, I'm taking an example of image processing uh, if you want to segregate uh, a proper foreground from the background let's say for some segmentation technique then you just uh, calculate the eigenvectors so that you see where the maximum change of those vectors is happening. And based on that, you will get to know the pixels uh, so that you can seg segment it appropriately. So this, this task also uh, takes the same uh, kind of technique such that they calculate uh, this statistic RU and later differentiate it with uh, respect to U so that uh, at the numerator, they equate it to zero so that you get the extrema of that statistic, RU. So that AU will become RU, which is nothing but an eigenvector problem, A lambda, uh, AX is equal to lambda X, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, so sure. If you go back to the previous slide, you're saying the U is is guessed, or wh wh how do you start with, how do you get the U? Yeah, U is uh, primarily... Uh, so, so you have a guess first and then you... you, you yeah, no, you don't need to guess. You don't need to guess. You solve the mean flow problem. It's a polynomial uh, combinatorial optimization problem for a given problem. Given adjacency matrix. It's just that you don't okay. want to keep resolving it. 
right okay. also to make sure that uh, you have a proper u uh, they they don't calculate the u at first i mean because later <laughs> in point in time you will get continuous uh, measurements yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so just, but just yeah we are discretizing the space here we are discretizing it to one and zeros so you need to make sure that whatever uh, you have assumed are correct so what they do is since they have uh, reduced it to a eigen vector problem they just calculate the, the eigen vector and, uh, and the, the maximum i mean the maximum eigen value and the corresponding vector will give you the maximum change and that is nothing but the u so uh, if if you are familiar i mean uh, with power series i mean uh, multiplying a matrix adjacency matrix uh, with itself and with a i think with a unit uh, vector uh, a few number of times let's say 100 or 200 number of times will give you a close approximation to the eigen vector uh, that has the maximum eigen value so here you can have uh, let's say for this example you can have at least eight eigen values and for that one of them will be the maximum and the corresponding eigen vector will nothing is nothing but the u vector right yeah <coughs> so for the example in the slides i just calculated uh, assuming that uh, i think i have it assuming that the first uh, five measurements should be one <laughs> and also the first five measurements are uh, in layers so you have a uh, u vector something kind of uh, first five or ones and next three are zeros and but instead of calculating that way uh, we are not guessing that u to be the uh, in layer set of measurements what what we do is as i said you multiply the adjacency matrix multiple times with a uh, vector of unit length then you get some values like this so r is nothing but uh, the statistic and here it is the maximum eigen value that you obtained and the corresponding uh, eigen vector so th here th these are in the continuous space to discretize them we just threshold it it's it's very similar uh, i mean to the image processing and other signal processing techniques you you either apply a low pass filter to it so that you you get a threshold and above uh, the values that are above the threshold you take that into consideration yeah oh this is okay so here the u of thresholding applied uh, u of t is since we are talking in terms of uh, discrete uh, values that is one and zeros we want to convert this u into a set of uh, i mean matrices of with values one and zeros for that we apply a thresholding t where we uh, get to calculate uh, t opt t opt is nothing but the optimal value uh, and it is nothing but uh, finding the dot product between u and u you initially take one one element of that uh, u vector as t let's say 40.4082 and you multiply uh, i mean whatever values are above that 0.4082 you assume them to be one so you initialize the vector v of t like that so for that example if you are taking the threshold as 4082 greater than equal to 4082 you will have a uh, bt of greater than equal to 4082 okay. i think i made the example uh, more convenient to me sure. let's say greater than 4082 so it will have zeros because this will form the exact u vector that we are talking about okay. here we have v of t and later you take the dot product of uh, v of t and u of t to get an optimal uh, t opt is nothing but the optimal pressure that you want to apply uh, this is so because uh, one one of the values if you have a dot product uh, with itself kind of approaches the maximum eigen vector so you won't miss the eigen vector so yeah 
uh, at last you might you might get uh, of <coughs> series of five ones and next three years. So and now we might ask ourselves where are we and what is the use of all of this matrices. <laughs> so the thing here is uh, you get to know where the maximum change is happening. So that is nothing but clearly an eigenvector and you uh, at the end you get a, a nice vector uh, Vt where you, you know which measurements are in layers so that the zeros are nothing but the out layers. So the, here we can see the first five measurements are in layers and the next three are out layers. So you just ignore them from this graph. And so the cut B will have, a, it will be assumed to be a good cut because cut B, no cut A. Cut A, cut a will be assumed to be a good cut and here as you can see it passes minimal number of edges but it kinds of separates a consistent set with a non-consistent set. So that's why it's kind of a minimal cut. After getting the measurements, uh, as we have initially discussed uh, here, you get to know uh, which are the consistent measurements. So you eventually localize the beacons where they are, their x, y points, coordinates. And no, my mistake. Here, you just get to know uh, which of those measurements are in less, that is, which of them are consistent or good measurements, but you still don't know where the beacons are. So, uh, based on those measurements, you just uh, have an assumption of uh, 2D grid. And if you are familiar with uh, who transform, there, uh, who transform is primarily was initially used uh, for. Uh, finding the lines in some cloud chambers uh, where some electrons are <coughs> made to flow in a kind of hydrogen liquid at some temperatures such that you get to see their path of uh, travel in what path they are traveling and you have cameras that take snaps of those uh, travel I mean it continuously takes snaps such that later uh, if you just filter among those pictures you get to know the exact path and they are surrounded by magnets and so it was, uh, it, it in fact uh, fetched him the inventor a Nobel Prize and uh, fetched the inventor of gas chambers a Nobel Prize, not the inventor of who. <laughs> I mean, not the inventor of uh, who. Yeah, who transformed. Uh, so here we, we just have a grid called as an accumulator grid. This grid is nothing but a set of 2D cells. And each of them uh, you can assume starting from 0, 0 with some uh, cell width of 5 meters or 10 meters. So when, when, whenever you are traveling and querying those beacons, if you see that uh, since we saw that a beacon might be localized in two positions. So you want to accurately find uh, which of these positions are uh, true. So you take a pair of measurements continuously and you vote, let's say uh, this is 5 comma 10 and this is 5 comma 5. So the corresponding uh, cells is too short. Will make it 5 comma 25. That it doesn't violate the 10 meter thing that I had said there. Uh, yeah. So you just vote the cell where you found the beacon location to be, and in the end, the cells having the maximum number of votes are nothing but uh, where exactly your beacons are. In that in that manner, uh, you localize the x y coordinates of the beacons. So here it might happen that uh, a case such that 
you might have uh, two cells having equal number of votes. In that case, you just uh, continue taking measurements, more measurements, such that you can <coughs> validate. Uh, I mean, you can localize the beacon locations. And usually, they the authors recommended some vote ratio of the highest cell and to the next highest cell to be of two. Uh, and they, based on their experiments, they said that it is a uh, good statistic to have a ratio of two uh, for the first highest to the uh, divided by the next. And, and then if, if, if for a given beacon, yeah. you don't have a, like a cell with a high enough vote, you just discard that and you pretend that you know nothing about that? May I say that? Uh, uh, all the cells are uniform votes, like that, something like that. Can I, well, I mean, equate uh, that to the case? You said that a good threshold is when the highest vote itself for a given beacon has at least twice as many votes as the next. Person, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So, but if that so doesn't... If, yeah, if you don't get that uh, ratio, then <coughs> they recommend to continue <coughs> taking the measurements. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, that means that you still don't uh, have the exact, uh, you, you haven't localized the beacon exactly. Yeah. So, so after you have localized the beacons, let's say the four beacons in that region, you know their XY coordinates, your robot knows that, you want to navigate in that region. Uh, this, this task is nothing but uh, most popularly called as simultaneous localization and mapping. It's used in all the robots that we see today, even the drones, the land terrestrial robots and underwater vehicles, where you build the map where your robot is traveling and as well as the same time simultaneously you localize yourself. So in, in such kind of maps, as I said in the beginning, uh, you need some some kind of sensor that, that makes you, uh, human analogy will be like walls that you can touch and you can sense and you can based on your memory you can think where you are and where tho those walls are just relative coordinates such that you can navigate from a point to another point or something like that so, so I EKF slam uh, the localization mapping technique that I just talked about it's a whole concept by itself and it will take uh, it will take more time to explain and uh, the authors here just have uh, kind of they because it's well popular within the community and uh, they just made sh make made sure that uh, whatever formulas that they have applied have just been discussed there. But uh, what I felt was I just diagrammatically explain uh, what happens in the cave slam. So you can have uh, I mean we can all have an idea of what happens in the vehicle when it tries to navigate within that region. So initially, uh, I'm considering the vehicle as a triangle with a circle on its nose kind of thing. So that not, that shows nothing but its bearing, uh, where it's pointed towards. And here, I've taken three beacons. Initially, the vehicle localizes the beacon, as explained in the previous part, after removing the outliers and then forming that grid voting technique so after localizing the beacons and it, it kind of travels and based on its odometry data like the DVL IMU it knows <coughs> its estimate I mean it just guesses its estimate uh, where it would be and in what orientation it would be and this is nothing but the state of uh, the robot I will interchange robot and vehicle simultaneously here In this problem, let's say uh, we have the state of robot as <coughs> so I've taken a vector which tells the state of the robot and here Rx, Ry are the location of the vehicle because based on the odometry data uh, 
like you travel with some velocity and if if you assume that you are traveling let's say from the origin and for uh, let's say for a couple of seconds at some velocity then you can definitely know at which, which point you are and the orientation that you are in rt is nothing but the theta bearing from the compass and bx by are the beacon locations so this vector is the state vector and th this will be used for estimating the vehicle i mean the vehicle will be using that to estimate its position and the beacon's position and continuously what we will do here in in the ekf ekf uh, i won't expanded it ekf is nothing but extended kalman filter a uh, basic kalman filter <laughs> Uh, you might heard. I will provide good references for it, so you can go through later. Uh, in in non mathematical sense, diagrammatical manner, such that uh, you will be it will be easy to pick up, and it's kind of uh, very popular and used in almost all aeroplanes tracking system, missile guidance systems, all such things. And yeah, so here at at time. t is let's say t is equal to 2 the vehicle has moved some distance among those that beacon field and thinks it is at a given location but what happens is that next when it uh, queries the beacons and senses it notices it notices that it it is not in the location that it expected itself to be i mean it's slightly off from its uh, current location current notion of its location so there is an error in its estimate so to correct this error uh, here we just apply i mean basic kalman filter i'll just explain it briefly very shortly x is the state you have initially a probability distribution i mean after moving for certain distance the vehicle assumes that it is at this location uh this is after let's say based on odometry and let's say time Here I am representing uh, the state of the vehicle as Gaussian curve. Uh, th that is the notion that it thinks that it is at that uh, position, and it will have a peak value uh, x1, x2. So at time t is equal to based on its velocity, it thinks that its its at uh, its state is x1. But after uh, the sensor measurement, that is the range uh, measurements. uh it notices that uh it, it is at i mean its state is x2 so the simple update step would be to com combine uh, these two mul just multiplying them and so you will have a new gaussian that that will have a huge peak and this this will be your new estimate x let's say x cap of 3 yeah so the the middle one uh middle the gaussian at the center uh, kind of almost closely tells you appro approximately tells you what your current state is so it it is like the more you sense the better you can estimate yourself similar to what we we touch the walls and sense where we are so the more and more the vehicle uh, has the range measurements it can better sense itself so in the triangle the dotted line is it's after the uh no it was based on odometry and the dashed line the dashed triangle is uh, based on the sensor measurements to correct uh, both of this uh, as i said the uh, central gaussian over there uh, you get here a new estimate of the vehicle state where the dashed dashed triangle tells that but uh 
the solid triangle is the actual state of the vehicle which the vehicle itself doesn't know but it kind of closely approximates uh, to its actual state so the filter is nothing but a step of This loop keeps on going within the vehicle continuously. It moves, it thinks its state to be something, and then it senses, it updates the state, and this keeps on going. So that uh, it at least gets to know a close value of its coordinates. And yeah, so in this way, the vehicle localizes itself, localizes the beacons, and travels within the region of the beacons, navigates within that space. Uh, I could quickly, uh, fortunately I uh, got hold of a video just showing how this works uh, and this is, this was, I think, this to be shown, it's made out of mousse, mousse is a kind of equivalent of ROS, uh, developed at MIT and they primarily developed it for uh, underwater and surface vehicles and it's widely used in many other organizations in Europe and agencies as well. Is it like a simulator? Uh, no, it's a distributed framework and of course you can build a simulator on top of it and as, as you might uh, know of ROS where you have certain, I mean the distributed term is used there because uh, you have different nodes talking to each other, uh, communicating uh, message packets and stuff and so that all happens at the same time with uh, good efficiency so that uh, it, it kinds of useful in uh, robots. I will just run it. So here, uh, just stop it. <laughs> here, the beacon is located here. <coughs> the vehicle is uh, given a lawnmower kind of path. Mm -hmm. Lawnmower, nothing but the garden mm -hmm. lawnmower. You tow it uh, in a lawnmower pattern uh, in your garden, such that you remove the grass, right? So the vehicle is given that path. This is nothing but you can call it a mission. And here, the beacon is doing nothing, but it will keep on, the vehicle will keep on querying it, and the beacon will respond. And with the range measurement, at the end of the mission, it will just home into the beacon's location. So you can, it's kind of deploying a beacon such that it acts as a home station for the vehicle, where it needs to return to. So the end point is here. The users don't tell where it has to return to, but based on uh, range measurements it eventually after localizing uh, the beacon it just goes in there so yeah it will just take some time so the first the vehicle queries i think it's not visible but th these messages are just some uh, the code encoded version that they have used in their message packets they don't have the range values yeah This, I, if, they, if, they end, if the two circles encounter, then they, no, it's not. No, it, it's not. It's it doesn't appear at any distance. Yeah. But it should be the it should be growing circles at every point where it gets back to yeah. the fly, yeah. and then you would see that. So here, when the vehicle responds, and the next measurement, when it queries it, if, if those two circles intersect, yeah. then you have a consistent measurement right. of the beacon. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but it could be visualized better yeah. by showing what the, the circles thing. should grow bigger and bigger <laughs> until it's the. No, 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 you should have more and more circles. So, yeah, yeah just, it just honed in into it. Yeah. <laughs> so, this kind of uh, application, I mean, more uh, complicated uh, stuffs are kind of expanded from this. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, I. Is level, what's the accuracy level like in practical? implementations of this? Uh, I, I wouldn't say that they exactly home into the exact location, but a few meters, let's say, within tens, tens of meters, 10 or 20 meters, I mean, that kind of accuracy is, uh, you, you can call that uh, algorithm or approach to be a good one. Yeah. So when, when I started reading this paper, I in fact wanted to try out uh, 
in in the vehicles that we have in our lab and i hopefully might try out with our uh, software distributed system and probably will uh, demo it in the future but i could get hold of the concepts of whatever that are being discussed in this paper and even i mailed the author asking him the data set uh, but since the, oh yeah this work was done around 2007 in uh, italian coast i guess yeah it was a joint mission by mit guys and some other guys that's it i will update the references and other good resources where you can if you are interested you can get to learn about kalman filters they are kind of cool uh, even recently in hacker news i think there was one post related to kalman pictures kalman filtering <coughs> using only images only pictures yeah you can also check it out Tangential questions. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, you said the audio waves are on twenty uh, kilohertz to one. Acoustic. Three. Yeah. Uh, is is the same as audio waves or different? <coughs> audio waves. I don't think so. Oh, it's different kind of. Yeah. What are acoustic waves? The Th these are just the sound waves. Sound waves, right? Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> the music here is twenty kilohertz. Right? It's right twenty. Oh, oh, so they are in the water itself. So. Yeah, no, but I, my question is because it's, this is the so you can produce audio waves underwater having the same frequencies you you are. Uh, you know, I, I, that was referring this side. Like, I, my question is, uh, like, this is at the riverbed. Uh, sorry, seabed. Right? Seabed. Right. Uh, do they at all talk about the effect on like deep sea marine life uh, mm. because of these kind of beacons? Uh, issues that are kind of raises, <coughs> but uh, as far as I know. I haven't read uh, much about the cases where it affects the marine life, okay. because uh, I think uh, they kind of act as a barrier only. So those measurements eventually are just noises, but they don't affect directly. I mean, biologically, uh, those marine organisms or living things underwater. Okay. And in fact, uh, there are few organisms or living beings underwater, like snapping shrimps. <coughs> there. they uh, they kind of uh, snap very frequently even in the singapore coast uh, uh, our lab has uh, in fact recorded some data and they are very loud mm -hmm. and kind of uh, provide you a noisy environment wherever so that you won't be able to know when the ship is homing in to the dock mm -hmm. and you also kind of track uh, when the ship is coming in when it is going when you have a busy port so when the snapping shrimps are around it's uh, hard to tackle and th these have a uh, high frequency i mean the frequency in those ranges as well yeah and of course they are marine organisms so they don't affect on other things yeah sure so for the uh, beacon localization i mean sure this was like a long mover that uh the one the video uh, is is not uh, the lawn mover yeah. is not uh, concerned with the beacon localization it's just a mission oh, I see. Uh, prepared by uh, the mission planner guy or who is operator beacon localization mm -hmm. how the because you said you shouldn't drive in a straight line yeah 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 so how should the vehicle drive to beacon localization please uh i think i missed that part the the last part they talk about uh, optimal exploration where uh, did i miss that part yeah optimal exploration where they say that you should move such that where the maximum gradient of the those measurements happen i mean where you can see the maximum change of those measurements let's say at uh, some point you hear it with some range 5 meters and at some point you don't hear it or uh, you sh you shouldn't move i mean of course your vehicle will know based on dead reckoning and the compass sensors if it is moving in a straight line so just by making sure that you are moving in a direction such that uh where let's say initially you are not hearing anything and suddenly you you uh, you just hear a range measurement so you travel in the direction for some time and uh, so okay now you are sure that you have heard something then you just take a random turn and move such that you see whether still you are he hearing the same range let's say whether it's the same 5 meters or 5 meters then you can make sure that you have the maximum gradient 
let's say you, you you are rotating within the same space and you are constantly getting 5 meters range of a particular beacon with a, of course with its beacon id then you can be sure that uh, those measurements won't be of any value how, how will it look like i mean i can't really visualize it i mean if you like this like a beacon and you sort of move in there is it show some random initial direction how would it look like if you see the I think that that would be best explained by a vector field. So beacon is somewhere. Then. Beacon is somewhere. Yeah. So we start somewhere. Then. I'll I'll just draw some vectors. <laughs> it will be easier to explain. Okay. Yeah. So the length of the vector is nothing but the change uh, that is happening when you are getting in close uh, to the beacon. Let's say initially you uh, you get some measurement, mm -hmm. uh, or you can start with no measurements and the more and more you approach uh, your circle radius should shrink telling you that uh, you are getting close, close to the beacon yeah. so that that tells you a good gradient is happening in that direction so if it okay. is not happening then you can be sure that uh, you are probably not traveling a good path so you should get closer to the beacon yeah here here the here the vector size is nothing but yeah of course you should get closer so Okay. Uh, you can even cross cross it. So mm -hmm. here, the vector size might increase, and later it, it might grow smaller, smaller and smaller. It diminishes as you grow. So the more information gain that you have, the better. So th these things, I, I, in fact, I am talking out of what uh, I think of, but. Uh, I wouldn't say they are perfect in explanation, but only after experimenting and actually implementing in a vehicle, you get to know what the actual scenario is like. And I think uh, that is the beauty of field robotics, where uh, you apply algorithms and you see in real time I mean, what happens exactly. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, uh, theoretically, we can keep on speaking more. <laughs> yeah, I feel so. How, how frequent do they pull this uh, beacon? So because here, uh, five uh, five seconds of five seconds uh, interval. interval. Yeah. Does it depend on the speed of the vehicle? Uh, no. Uh, at maximum, your vehicle underwater vehicle travels at about three to four knots. Okay, yeah. so five seconds is good. Yeah, good enough. So uh, all the underwater vehicles, because uh, they act like a system where if you uh, if you are not moving good, I mean good enough uh, at at good enough speed, you will eventually drown. <laughs> I mean oh, right. because the pitch will keep on increases and the, the like the aeroplane. Aero, aeroplane right? Yeah, it's very very similar to okay, that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes so sense. you have to maintain a minimum speed. So with that minimum speed in mind, you can uh, of course tell what. Uh, the time frame should be, time interval should be. So that's it guys. Any other thing to discuss? I would, I would love to discuss. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.